Good morning, everyone. Um, so if you joined us on Tuesday, we're here for just another exciting installment of teletherapy and virtual offerings. If you didn't join us on Monday, then this is only your first exposure to Sally and I this week. Um, so what we wanted to do is um, Libby and Leanne wanted us to present um, once again on introduction to teletherapy or introduction to virtual offerings. So that's what we plan to do today. If you uh, joined us for uh, one of our previous trainings that we did in the spring, introduction to telespeech or something like that, you're going to see some similar information, but we also enhance this a bit to make it a little bit more comprehensive given that we're a little further down the road in this uh, teletherapy situation uh, in August than we were in March for some of you. So some of the goals for today, I uh, want to give you guys an understanding of the basics of teletherapy, some getting started tips, some things to think about, uh, an introduction to the telepractice resources team. So uh, the Department of Ed and Libby and Leanne have created a team specific to support and resources for telepractice. And anyone uh, within the system can join. Uh, establishing a network and place to share resources, which is also what we're going to use that Microsoft team for. And some familiarity with virtual collaboration and resources and things that we can use. So we want you to leave today with just a basic overview of what to expect, how to get started, and just some things for you to start thinking about or playing with when you get the chance. So these are our presenters today. Uh, of course, Sally and I, which I think you, uh, many of you are familiar with. And then we also have Annika Lafferty with us today because I think we do have some OTs and PTs joining us. Um, a lot of the content will be pertinent to everyone today, but uh, Annie has some resources that are going to be specific to OT that she'll go over later on in the presentation. OK, so let's talk a little bit uh, first about some resources um, and where you can find things and where your opportunities are for collaboration. So you can see at the top we have this telepractice training and support group team. I know there's lots of you that are members of that Microsoft team thus far. If you aren't, uh, you can easily join. Uh, Libby or Leanne can get you um, access to the team. Once you're a member of that team, uh, you can see we're going to have on the left side, we're going to have some, some channels in that team. So those are basically subgroups uh, that are specific to certain areas where we know there are going to be probably quite a few questions in regards to providing virtual therapy. So maybe AAC and pre-K, autism spectrum disorders, and we may add some channels if we start getting some questions in some other areas. But in these channels, they're going to have some guest experts, some very specific resources for these particular uh, areas of service, and a place where you all as therapists can ask questions or request things or maybe pose uh, some thoughts that may be pertinent to those specific areas. And then if you go one over, there's the resource notebook. So this is a OneNote notebook that Libby has spent an incredible amount of time creating and updating and continues to update. Uh, it contains resources for various aspects of therapy, uh, guidance for specific platforms, and uh, a place for you, where you can go if you're looking for resources on a specific area. It's a good place to start. You might be able to find some good worksheets or places to go or, or things that you can find to begin your journey in teletherapy. We also have a tab that um, is Microsoft Stream, which is uh, where you'll find all of these recorded sessions, PowerPoint sessions, meeting videos, notes, etc. If you don't get to if you don't get a chance to attend any of the trainings live, uh, they've all been recorded and you can watch them at your leisure. And then we are going to continue the telepracticing trainings. So uh, we're going to we're going to continue those at the same time. They're going to be uh, the last Friday of every month at 11 o'clock. We're going to do about 11 to 1130, 11 to 1145. Um, and then for the OTs and PTs, we're going to do one o'clock 
uh, the same time we did them in the spring, but they'll be once a month, the last Friday of the month. It's going to be some not telepractice 101. It's going to be like telepractice 102. So we're going to be going over some specific resources, uh, demoing some things, and it's going to be actually probably a little bit more in depth than it was in the spring. So if you attended any of those telepracticing trainings, we wanted to try and cram a lot into a little in that amount of time. We wanted to get as many resources out there in terms of uh, apps that you could use or resources you could go to to try and get your bearings. Uh, but we're going to actually really hone in on some very specific things this fall so uh, we can really enhance our skills in some certain areas. And then there'll be a time for question and answer, an opportunity for you to got, or for you all to maybe ask for specific things or request things for us to cover in future sessions. And then down here at the bottom in the, in the salmon color, this is your opportunity to create a county-based team. I know that uh, many of you did this in the spring. You created a, a team that included uh, all of your therapy providers for your county, and it was a place where you could provide county-specific forms, county-specific guidance, and then your meeting notes or possibly trainings, question and answer, uh, frequently asked questions type session, but these are items that would be specific to what your county is requesting or what your county is um, putting into place as a uh, procedure for the use of virtual therapy or just a place, you know, to share information, even if we are uh, in school face to face, provide guidance to you. So let's begin by going over just some forms or some suggestions for uh, things that can be utilized uh, to begin and get organized. Um, I put these under a general page because most of the, the county specific teams I've been involved in have these in, in kind of these specific places. So under files or under teletherapy admin resources. So uh, this is a screenshot of a, a tab in a specific Microsoft team. You can see it's a files tab. It's a place where you can drag and drop uh, folders that contain information or specific documents, PDFs, Word documents, presentations, whatever you want. You can drop in there and organize it by uh, whatever file type that you want. But it's a great place. Uh, whether you're in your county specific team or you're uh, in the teletherapy resources team, uh, it's a great place to put uh, and organize some of those resources. And then um, in the telepractice training and support group, um, just a little overview of you know what's going to be in there. Uh, it's a place where you can provide resources, collaboration, training. I kind of went over that in the chart. But uh, something that's, if you guys aren't familiar with using Microsoft Teams, in the in the general tab, uh, you can you can tag anybody or or the whole group if you're asking of a specific question, and you can do that by typing at in their name or at telepractice training, um, and it'll uh, send an alert to the whole team. So you can tag somebody within the team. So let's say after the training today you've got a specific question about something that we presented, you could tag me at Rhea Dyer within that team and it'll alert me that someone's asking me a question. So um, it's kind of a fun way to, um, you know, ask certain people specific things. Um, and then of course, uh, we talked about the channels and resources that'll be updated. So uh, let's talk about uh, the concept of a contact form. This is something that uh, those of us who were in counties that converted to virtual therapy offerings in the spring, uh, this is something that several counties required. And I included this in this training as well. So in the event that maybe your county didn't do virtual offerings in the spring and you're trying to figure it out as a possibility for the fall, you had some of these resources. Um, this was used as a way to contact parents to determine whether students would be participating in live virtual sessions at home, receiving some sort of resource packet, phone consultation, or, re or receiving packets only. This was a way in the spring when things happened so quickly to kind of track what we were going to be providing to what particular students. Obviously, you want to check to see if your county 
has developed one. If they haven't, you know, we have some sample forms if you're if you're looking for some guidance on how to create one of those. Uh, just kind of a thought process if um, it comes to be again that we have to kind of make those selections. And then a consent form. So this is documentation of verbal consent for parents to participate uh, in live virtual therapy at home if your county requires one. Uh, I would recommend you have this consent form or, or some version of a consent form in place indicating that the parents are giving you consent to provide uh, that service at home. Um, this is a great form to add to your county team sites. If you if you don't have one of these and you need an example, um, you know you can. I have several examples. If you, if you need one, just you know send me a message in Teams or email me, um, and I can send you something um, like that. If you guys are looking to kind of get your ducks in a row on a on a consent form, and then uh, in the telepractice team, uh, there's a tab at the top called resources, and that is the resource notebook. And it is a OneNote notebook that uh, captures resources in a lot of different areas of the practice. So you can see here's a screenshot of um, all the different tabs in the OneNote notebook. So you can see there's um, lots of different resources that we might be looking for. And then just some general things in regards to teletherapy or privacy or ASHA resources, things like that. And Libby spends a lot of time keeping this updated with new resources and new information as it becomes available. So that is in the um, telepractice training and resource team. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, teletherapy etiquette. So we're going to kind of switch gears here from resources and forms and things like that for you guys to consider. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, teletherapy etiquette. Um, I'm going to let Sally talk a little bit about this section, but I do want you to know we we did create a document uh, that addresses some teletherapy etiquette. If anyone wants that, I'd be glad to share it. Um, and, and just a little thought to remember, even though these are some unusual circumstances, we're still professionals. So um, it's always our goal to maintain our professionalism, whether we're in brick and mortar buildings or providing virtual therapy in school or providing virtual therapy at home. There's still a uh, set of guidelines and ethics and morals that um, govern those circumstances. So we want to make sure that we are um, addressing those things. So Sally, anything you want to say about teletherapy etiquette? Uh, sure. I mean, just to piggyback off of what you discussed, I mean, if uh, we're going to be sharing with you some teletherapy uh, social media um, groups on Facebook and things like that. And and you will hear some interesting stories and uh, uh, things of uh, involving pets and children. And, um, you know, we just want to we want to just emphasize that it's so important. We understand that, you know, your kids are home and and obviously your dogs live there too or <laughs> but we we just want to make sure that we're doing the best we can to keep a professional environment during the sessions um i think that's really all okay um okay so one of the things that we ran into in the spring and of course um if if we were in i, I think the circumstances are likely going to be different this fall but you know let's say if if we do end up in a situation like we did this spring and we are in an all remote format in one place or another, uh, one of the things that, that we all really struggled with are a lot of these families are overwhelmed. So uh, they're getting communication from all sorts of different providers and educators and teachers and um, you know they're trying to manage all these communications in the midst of things all being very new, being at home or you know being away from school. So I left this I left this slide in there from a previous presentation because it was it's very pertinent in um, if, if the situation reoccurs this fall that you can work together with your other providers to support families. So if you have several related service providers who are providing services to those families, do your best to streamline those communications, to streamline those interventions that maybe you and the vision provider could participate in the same live session and 
be involved with the student at once, or you provide your service and the vision specialist uh, logs on at the end because maybe they're an indirect service and they just want to check in with the family to see how everything's going. But that's not an additional communication that the family has to manage or an additional time to log in or something like that. So do your best to kind of streamline that communication with the family to keep things as simple as possible as them. Because if, if you have a student that has an IEP that has uh, one or two or three uh, academic services and then two or three related service situations, um, that's a lot for a family to keep track of. And everyone's trying to log in with them live. So even if those other therapists aren't providing something directly, it can be an effort to streamline those communications. And it's possibly an opportunity to give the other IEP providers the ability to collaborate with you and the parents. So I know if you're providing a service when we're in under traditional circumstances, a lot of times it's very difficult to manage that, that sort of collaboration when we're in a brick and mortar situation. How often do we get the chance to see all of those students related service providers? Probably not very often. So it is an opportunity that we uh, usually don't get to be able to collaborate, to, to be able to collaborate with the um, other therapists or other providers on the team. Um, so activities for telehealth. I'm going to let uh, Sally talk about these next couple slides a little bit. Um, we're going to go over some more specific resources uh, later in the session, but I wanted to talk just a little bit about activities first. OK, great. So activities for telepractice. Um, we want to just emphasize that, you know, uh, just set, like in our regular practice and face to face, um, the younger the student, the more quickly you're going to need to change activities. So we all know that we have to kind of come prepared and ready to uh, ready to move on to the next activity uh, with these kiddos because their attention span just isn't isn't what it is uh, for the older students typically. So, you know, our younger kiddos, they really enjoy interactive materials like games, apps, interactive therapy materials, interactive therapy websites, uh, things like that. The older students, you know, some of them uh, I prefer that kind of thing as well. But but a lot of times you can work on just drill worksheets uh, if you're working on articulation or or some basic language um, and they don't require quite as uh, visually stimulating activities. Let's see here, we'll go to the next slide. Um, we're just giving you a few examples here. Uh, ABC -ya is a really great website that has a lot of fun games and they break it down um, to grade level. So it's really helpful um, for kind of tailoring it to children's interests at uh, each particular grade level. Um, articulation Station is one of our favorites for working on articulation. I guarantee most of you uh, speech paths have used that, but there are ways that you can use it via telepractice that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, teachers Pay Teachers is also another favorite that we absolutely uh, love to use. And um, a lot of the Teacher Pay Teachers um, accounts have um, activities that are specific to telepractice, but really, I mean, you can get creative and you can, um, we've used things that were just created for sitting at a table with a student and we just modify it to um, to telepractice. So uh, the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get with making little modifications like that and kind of coming up with your own ideas. But let me tell you, especially since COVID, um, the resources out there for showing you and giving you ideas. You know, I myself am not as creative as some of these folks out here, and I'm I'm always blown away by some of the ideas that they give me. Um, and and just by being part of some some of the social media platforms that that are out there and YouTube uh, channels and things, um, there's some really, really wonderful ideas out there. And speaking of that, there here's just three Facebook groups. We've got telepractice for SLPs, teletherapy materials for SLPs, teletherapy for SLPs and OTs. I'm not leaving you out, PTs. Um, uh, Annie will talk about those kind of things um, in the future. But, but um, you know, there's just a 
a huge amount of information out there for you uh, to give you ideas and to also just ask questions and and, and get support. Um, there's another one called Green Screen, and we touched on that back in um, in the spring called uh, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's it's Green Screens for Teletherapy uh, Ideas. And um, I mean, some of our team have been working over the summer because they were so excited about the opportunity to, to utilize green screens and therapy. So, you know, having said that, don't feel like you have to get all tech savvy and all, all uh, you know, crazy with this. You, I mean, if you enjoy that kind of thing, by all means, go for it. But there are just really simple ways. You don't have to make it um, super um involved and honestly some of my best sessions have been with just a you know worksheet that i shared on screen and using uh, the annotate button in in zoom which is what our platform but there are other options where the child had to put hearts every time they said their sound correctly or or something like that that helps me uh you know verify their auditory discrimination and things like that so uh, all i'm saying is you know uh, you can keep it really simple and still have a great session. But these are some opportunities for, um, you know, getting a little more complicated if you choose. And again, uh, just great resources for questions. All right, do's and don'ts. So these are just a list of as Rhea and I were going down through kind of like, okay, what what are just absolutely you got to do these things and what are the things that we're just like, eh, let's let's stay away from that, you know, um, and and having done this for a while, uh, this is the list that we came up with. So for the do's, you know, obviously prepare your session just as you would any other speech session. As you get more comfortable, you're going to require less preparation, but in the beginning, you know, Kids are tech savvy and and they're going to you're going to lose them if you're spending too much time uh, trying to get your materials ready and share your screen. So uh, it's just really, really important that you get as comfortable as you can ahead of time. And that's why Rhea and I always suggest getting with a buddy and practicing practice with your own child if you want to. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you can do that, but but that's so important. Um, Include direct intervention and data tracking into your session. Prepare to use your best verbal instruction. Remember, you can't, you know, be as uh, uh, tactily um, dependent because you are not able to do that. So you've got to use really descriptive verbal instruction. Um, be patient. Again, these students are at home. They're not at school. Um, we all know that kiddos a lot of times behave differently at home and have different distractors. So we we try to be as patient as we can. Incorporate a new reward system into your session. So some of the things that kids find really fun is that they get to go grab a toy um, out of their room to show you at the end or have it ready or you show them your your dog or your cat or your I don't know your gecko, <laughs> um, you know, just show them uh, something from your house at the end. Um, you know, uh, they want to kind of get a little insight into you too. So that can often be fun and really uh, something that they look forward to that motivates them. Um, and then uh, the last do is to allow yourself time in between sessions to prepare for the next. You know, as again, you get more comfortable and savvy with it, you might be able to, to bounce right into the next section fairly quickly, session very quickly, but, um, you know, making sure that you give yourself plenty of time so that you're prepared. And now for the don'ts. So don't allow distractions in your environment to interrupt your session. And we did put a little caveat there as best you can right now. We understand sometimes it's just going to happen. Um, when you're in your home, things happen. The doorbell rings or, you know, somebody's mowing the lawn outside. Um, we, you know, we understand that. But, um, you know, we don't want to be stopping a session to go let the dog out or, you know, uh, have a lot of interruptions like that. Um, don't be unprepared. We've talked about that. You want to have tabs pulled up if you're if you're using games or apps. Um, Try not to be distracted. Again, those those things in your environment at your home also are are different for you as well. And there are distractions that might keep you from uh, keeping your students attention and staying engaged with them. They still need to feel like they're the the priority at that time. 
um, and allow do not allow for you to be the adult supervision. Remember that a caregiver must be present um, just for your protection and the child's. You want to make sure that that's um, that's what's going on in the home. Um, and don't give up. Keep in mind this is different for all of us, even for those of us who've been doing telepractice for a while. We haven't been doing it in the students' homes, uh, at least our company, you know, because we mostly have been contracting to the schools and serving students in the schools. So this is new for us too, dealing with um, the distractions in the home environment and dealing with, uh, you know, uh, setting things up in the home instead of at school. So just to interject here for a minute, when we came up with these do's and don'ts originally, um, both sides were in home environments. All of our therapists were in home environments and all of our students were in home environments. Um, I realized that that may be different this fall. Um, if we are in a remote learning situation, it's likely that therapists will be in our buildings, in school buildings. Our students will be at home, but the providers will likely be in buildings, which oh, is easier for everybody in terms of managing connection. What issues. is it? Um, managing connection issues and uh, having materials at their fingertips and things like that. It would give you all a much greater opportunity to be prepared, not distracted, things like that. If you're in your typical work setting instead of at home. However, in the event that uh, let's call it worst case scenario where both sides are again at home. We kind of left these in there as as a resource. So um, in the event that both both sides of the equation are at home, you know, managing interruptions and things like that is important. All right, Sally, if you wanted to go over this one, I'll I'll take it back at Medicaid billing. OK, sure. Um, so uh, we just kind of want to talk about some positives here um, and just some overall differences from traditional therapy. So, you know, remembering that if the children are in their home, you have an opportunity to engage the caregiver. Um, I have talked with uh, several of our therapists who have really enjoyed that. Um, of course, it's that's not always the case. Sometimes the caregiver is not as involved, but when they are, um, you know, that's a really wonderful opportunity to teach them how to practice at home after the session is over and to show them exactly what you do in therapy. Um, remember that compared to traditional therapy, you do have to strengthen your auditory and verbal cues. You don't have that tactile component. Um, so just making sure that you rem remember that um, going in. Managing technology is still difficult for some of us. We totally get that. So just try to work out the kinks as best you can before you begin uh, your session and before you kind of get rolling. Uh, figuring out how the student will make selections if the app isn't interactive. Uh, and that's that's something that we'll talk about more as we talk about. Uh, we're going to go into more detail in our telepracticing sessions in the coming months. Um, but just know that, you know, uh, we have when, for example, when we share an iPad, um, iPads are not interactive on the student's end. So if you've got the iPad and you're sharing it over the screen, the student can see what's on your iPad, but they can't touch you know, their screen and activate it. They can't use a mouse to activate it. So, you know, we will end up doing things like uh, using the annotate button to draw numbers over the um, uh, matching cards so the child will say I need number one and number two please turn those over um, you know we, we come up with some uh, we highlight things uh, you know just just anything we can do to to add a little um, extra ability for them to have an interaction even if they can't touch it now that ABC uh, website a lot of times you can um, give the student mouse access and then they can use their mouse to interact with a certain website again that depends on what type of platform um, I mean device that they're on uh, so again we'll go into more details on that um, as as we move forward with these trainings um, and we did do that a little bit in the in the spring, so you should have access to those telepracticing sessions um, where we talked about um, ways to share and ways to annotate. Um, and then lastly, 
uh, just remember you can still use some of your favorite activities. You just have to adapt them to virtual settings. And as I mentioned before, there is so much information out there. You could even Google, you know, how to use such and such over Zoom or over Teams, you know, things like that. So, so um, just remember that there are ways um, to adapt. Don't be afraid of it. I know that's easier said than done, but um, it can be it can be fun. All right, so I'll take it over the fun stuff. Um, Medicaid billing and targeted case management. So just in case you're wondering uh, whether the services that we provide are billable uh, via uh, teletherapy, they are. So uh, the difference is that you would use the same exact five digit CPT code that you're used to using with Medicaid billing, but you add a GT modifier, so it would be 92507 GT to indicate that it was uh, conducted via telepractice. So that is the difference. Uh, if it doesn't have a modifier, uh, it's an in-person service. If it does have a modifier, it's a service that was administered via telepractice. Uh, services that aren't provided directly and are more coaching focused or, or um, fall under the guidelines of targeted case management can be billed. Even if we're, you know, in a remote format, the students aren't, you know, in our building buildings. For those of you who are familiar with uh, targeted case management and you and you know that very well, you know that a lot of the activities that surround uh, doing targeted case management and, and completing that billing don't require the students to be physically in um, our brick and mortar buildings. A lot of it is connections with uh, professionals or collaborating with parents and things like that. So um, targeted case management is still in play. Um, I know a lot of the county team site have uh, guidance on this in the frequently asked questions. Sally and I created a little targeted case management document as it related to remote learning for the spring. If you um, if, if you want me to share that document with you, and like I said, it has not been vetted or approved by the Department of Ed in any way, but I'd be glad to share it with you um, just as something we created, you know, therapist to therapist, if you if you ask for it, if you want to, you know, edit it or or alter it and provide that guidance to your therapist this fall. Um, OK, frequently asked questions. Uh, I know in a lot of your county uh, team site. There's a frequently asked questions section. Uh, this is a place that I know a lot of the counties who have lead therapists or that all the therapists are uh, members of their county team. It's a place where you can get quick answers to the whole group all at once without having to start email threads or people just individual people texting back and forth. This is an easy way to get to everyone in one fail swoop. Um, I don't think we have a frequently asked questions section in the telepractice resource teams, um, but if you have a, a question, um, you can always, like I said, tag someone or tag the entire team. It'll create a chat thread and we can um, get that question answered for you. Uh, a lot of the frequently asked questions on the state level uh, are a little bit difficult because as you know, each of your counties has a uh, level of control to make decisions for your individual county. And then supervision for assistance. Um, so uh, the supervision requirements for um, SLPAs and also uh, provisional licensees or CFYs has been uh, temporarily lifted. So SLPAs and CFYs who are traditionally not allowed to provide services via telepractice are currently allowed to do so given the state of emergency and situation in regards to the pandemic. Supervision for PT and OT remain the same as they are already outlined by the state licensure boards. But for SLPAs, the supervision requirements have changed slightly due to um, accommodating the situation. So these are this is guidance that has come uh, down from the Department of Ed that they must be supervised 100% uh, for the first telepractice session and then must have 25% direct supervision after that. So that's uh, a little bit more than what we're used to when we're in tr under traditional circumstances. So you need to be aware, um, be aware of that if you are someone who supervises an SLPA. 
All right, and done with the basics. Um, so that's just kind of the um, kind of the, the the basic overview, the initial considerations. So now we're going to kind of switch gears and talk about the uh, kind of get into a little bit of the logistics of uh, completing telepractice. And I think what we'll do since we're recording this, we'll um, I had a place that I kind of built in for questions so far. But if you guys want to just take a minute or two and jot down those uh, questions, we'll handle them at the end since we're going to have a, um, a lot of time for questions and answers. So let's talk a little bit about uh, telepractice logistics, equipment, connections, platforms, um, things like that. So um, I know that platforms are a, a, a big topic of conversation. Uh, every county it has the ability to choose their own platform or way methodology for delivering telepractice services. Um, the Department of Ed has aligned itself with Microsoft 365, as you all know, because all of your K-12 email addresses are Microsoft addresses. So um, I know that many of you are using Teams as your official platform, but I do know there are counties that are using other types of platforms. Uh, they're using Zoom, they're using Skype, they're using Ring, they're using Google Meet. I, I added just a couple of the more common ones here. Um, as you've heard Sally and I mentioned before, we use Zoom as our official platform. When, when we started using Zoom um, a long time ago, you know, many, many years ago, uh, Microsoft Teams wasn't nearly as robust as it is now in, in this space. Um, and mostly it was Skype, which, which it wasn't a very interactive platform at that time. So um, I think all, all of these platforms have been, you know, incredibly enhanced uh, in recent times. But um, if, you, if your county is using Teams, the Department of Ed has uh, tons of resources in using Teams. And if there's anything specific that you're struggling to do or any guidance that you want on how to do things via Teams, let us know because we have very specific resources at the Department of Ed that can put out trainings or videos or guidance on those sort of things. Um, if you're using Zoom, Sally and I are um, experts in Zoom. Uh, so if you have any, if your county is using that platform and you have any questions about that, you know, be sure and let us know. Um, I'm a little bit less familiar with some of the other platforms, but, you know, I feel like I have all of these downloaded on my computer because I never know what <laughs> where someone's going to be using for a meeting. So I feel like I, you know, know a little bit about a little bit about most all of these. So um, if, if, and if you're trying to choose a platform and you need some help or you want some advice, you know, be sure and reach out if you need anything specifically from me or, you know, from Libby or Leanne. Um, I know that that um, is sometimes an overwhelming decision. But um, here's some things to uh, consider when you're selecting a platform. Uh, you want to be sure to navigate the appropriate permissions. So. Uh, as it stands right now, rules have been relaxed in regards to HIPAA, uh, but be informed regarding the platforms that's, that support HIPAA compliance because you want to make sure that whatever you choose is going to have the appropriate permissions when things return to some state of normal and, and those guidelines are firmed back up. You don't want to you know, go all in on a platform that isn't going to work when some of these guidelines are no longer relaxed. Um, and I know that uh, being HIPAA compliant and a telepractice platform requires some additional things, but at this moment right now, if you just ensure that your platform does have that capability, you can, you can navigate those circumstances a little bit later. Um, you obviously for best quality, you wanna be sure that the, the platform has video and audio capability. And uh, different platforms have various capabilities such as screen sharing, content sharing, and interactivity. You wanna dig into that a little bit uh, to make sure that the platform that you choose gives you what you want out of it. So if you're looking for something that is uh, very interactive, uh, very has, has lots of sharing capabilities and content sharing and interactivity, um, you might be uh, not using WebEx uh, or something like that. Um, and 
you know, different different platforms have different capabilities such as that. We're going to talk a little bit about that um, later on. And if your if your county hasn't already selected a platform, you know, I can I can easily help you navigate some of that if you've got some specific questions. Um, let's talk a little bit about equipment. So um, contrary to what, you know, what we all faced this spring where we were all in home situations, like I said, I think based on the guidance right now, uh, if we are in a remote learning model, it's likely that uh, uh, us as providers and therapists will be in our home school buildings, uh, which tackles one great barrier of equipment because we would be in places where you guys are familiar with your equipment, you have computer and internet access and all that. So, um, but again, let's talk about things in, in kind of that worst case scenario format. So you are prepared uh, for a, a situation again, where you might be at home or something like that, because it can only get better if you're at school. So obviously as a therapist, you need a computer or tablet uh, with a built-in or external camera as well as a microphone. If your uh, school-issued computer does not have a built-in camera, I know that that's more common than I than I really thought it was. Um, you can uh, you can get an external camera to to go with your uh, go with your computer. Um, I can uh, show you what one of those looks like uh, at the end. We have several that we use um, for various things, but you know, it's not a deal breaker if your school issued computer does not have a built in camera um, and a microphone. So uh, almost all of your school issued computers or tablets will have a microphone. Um, but the decision to use an external microphone is you is up to you. We use uh, external microphones in, in all of our scenarios, whether we're at school or at home. All of us therapist in and student in when we're at school, we use external microphones. It decreases background noise. It, it provides some clarity in your voice as well as the students. And in optimal conditions, we're looking for very precise um, you know, sound production or uh, we're looking for very uh, specific things and, and what we want the students to do and we don't want any audio to be an issue with that. Keep in mind, I know a lot of your counties are uh, on one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. I would really try to stay away from using a Chromebook as a therapist if possible. You might not be able to control it on the student end. If the student has a, a Chromebook and that is their issued piece of equipment, then you know we've got to go with that. But I'd really try and stay away from a Chromebook. They are really not built for telepractice. They're not built for video conferencing. They do not have good video, audio, sharing capability, interactivity, just as a piece of equipment. So try as much as you can to uh, stay on, e even if you can get an iPad. I know lots of you have iPads in uh, that, that you have at school. Try if, if at the very least to be on an iPad because they at least have better uh, audio and video capability. Uh, we talked a little bit about external microphone, but uh, some of you may also choose to use headphones. Uh, another option is using a document camera. So if you're using, uh, if you're going to be sharing something that you have on paper, uh, you may use a document camera. A little fun fact, it's very easy to turn your iPhone or smartphone into a document camera. Uh, so don't, don't think you have to get too fancy for that. And then uh, I know some of you will run uh, an external iPad. So you may be conducting teletherapy on your school issued laptop, but you may be sharing your iPad uh, for interactive content, uh, interactive content. So you may be using articulation station on your iPad in which you're sharing on your computer. So that's a possibility as well. You may be running two pieces of equipment. Just kind of depends on, you know, how fancy you need to get or want to get. These are kind of equipment options. Uh, this is a little visual that I pulled from a, um, an SLP blogger that she had a nice little setup. Um, these are not all required elements, but you can see here some of the basic setup. I mean, obviously a chair is important and a table, um, but uh, you can see the a modem there in the center. That's important. 
Um, and uh, if you want to use headphones, you can see those headphones have a little mic that will, um, you can put that, you know, under your chin where it doesn't go right in front of your mouth, but it provides some clarity to the student on the student end in um, making your voice very clear. And of course you can see a computer there. So these are some, you know, basic, either, either home office essentials, your school office essentials, you know, these are kind of the basics. That is also a picture in between the modem and the chair. That is an external camera. So if, like I said, you're looking at purchasing uh, an external camera, uh, that's an example of, of one. There are tons and tons of them out there. And a lot of them are very affordable. So a lot of them are not very expensive. Um, in terms of an external microphone, they are also really very affordable. Uh, the ones that we use are called the Blue Snowball microphones. Use are called the Blue Snowball microphones. Use are called the Blue Snowball. My use are called the Blue Snowball. My use are called the Blue Snowball. My use are called the Blue Snowball. Hi, Hi. Something's happening with your sound. All right, that was fun. Um, Adds so, a little excitement. Yeah. The microphone that we use is called the Blue Snowball microphone. It's about $35. You can find it at any Staples, Best Buy, Amazon. Um, it, it's, it's really easy to find, but there are lots and lots and lots of these, and they, and they aren't very expensive. Um, in terms of connection, uh, if you're conducting teletherapy from a school building, Almost all school internet and Wi-Fi should be sufficient. In rare cases, if your room is, I mean, off of the gym in a closet that's the furthest away from the Wi-Fi router, or you're in a room that's kind of on the corner of the school that has all concrete walls, you may have an issue. But I know most of you have ethernet drops in your rooms. Um, so that is, you know, something that, uh, is, is very easy. Uh, you can run video conferencing software from ethernet, Wi-Fi, or cellular connection if you have a strong enough cell cellular connection. But if you're really doing things best case scenario, you really, ethernet will give you the best and most consistent quality. When we're all of our telepractice computers on the school and our therapist ends are all hooked into ethernet because Wi-Fi connectivity, you know, it sort of ebbs and flows depending on how many people are using it and, you know, that kind of thing. Ethernet's very consistent. Um, let's talk a little bit about permission. You want to consider whether your county requires permission before initiating teletherapy. We talked a little bit about that in the concept of a consent form. Uh, earlier in the session. Uh, in most situations, parents are notified and consulted prior to beginning teletherapy. This is something that if we're just under traditional circumstances and we're providing teletherapy at the school, all of our parents are notified via a letter and, and we have consent and things like that. Um, and we really probably should have that if you were initi initiating teletherapy on, on a remote learning circumstance as well. But again, that is a county so if you're a lead or if you're someone who's going to be in the decision making um, situation you might want to consider um, before you initiate teletherapy services okay so i am going to let sally talk a little bit about um, actually conducting teletherapy uh, what materials do we use what types of students do we generally choose and how do we track goals and collect data Take oh. it away, Sally. <laughs> okay. So um, best candidates for teletherapy. Um, you know, we understand that at certain uh, points in this process, we may not get to choose. Everyone is teletherapy uh, when the schools are completely remote. But um, we're talking about like when you're trying to make decisions, um, on on which students are going to benefit most from this platform or or be a fit um, ideal candidates are those that can independently attend and participate with the lesson 
Um, generally, these are your articulation kiddos, your students who have mild to moderate language deficits, your fluency students, kids working on social language. Um, believe it or not, I know there are some skeptics out there about that, but we have been able to really uh, do some wonderful things with social language via telepractice. Also voice, you know, those are going to be your ideal. Um, AAC students, um, students on the autism spectrum, they can. And, and we have had that um, both both of those diagnoses, um, students that just really did well in teletherapy, but they often do require some additional um, training and expertise from you uh, to where you're comfortable uh, addressing their specific needs. Pre-K students, we have several of our therapists who absolutely love working with pre-K kiddos in um, telepractice, but again, they're going to require some extra prompting and some extra, um, you know, uh, ch frequent changes in activities and things like that. Maybe uh, jumping up and, and dancing their sillies out uh, every day every other activity or something like that you know um we've got all kinds of ideas uh for ways to make it a little more interactive even um for those younger kiddos um students are typically selected on a case-by-case -case basis you know because they're all unique there's going to be times when uh something's just like mm, i'm not sure that this kiddo is is gonna um respond to teletherapy the way I need them to. Uh, other other students may surprise you and, and respond very favorably to it when you didn't think that they would. Um, but again, COVID has changed that selection process when uh, we are in a situation where all services are delivered remotely. And I hope that from, from what we're telling you even today and, and we'll get into um, in the future when we get into more detail, I hope that you feel encouraged if we would come across a situation like that again, that uh, we really have spent a large amount of time in our practice trying to find ways and, and brainstorm ways to make sure that teletherapy is applicable to all of our students. Um, and again, you know, we, we have kids that are visually impaired or hearing impaired that, 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 that does present a challenge and we understand that. Um, but, but, we're trying really hard to to come up with some great ideas for um, for all your students. And just to kind of interject here for a minute, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, I have AAC students. I have nonverbal students. I have students on the spectrum on my caseload. We we have people in our practice that do this. Almost all the time, you know, one of one of our teletherapists works in AAC probably 60% of his week. Uh, right now, he's programming an eye gaze device for a student that we uh, have been seeing remotely since May. Um, got an eye gaze device. He has the eye gaze device right now. He's programming it, getting it back to the family, and we're going to be initiating use of that eye gaze device, all of it via telepractice. He's only intervened with that family via telepractice. So, you know, these situations are possible and as new people to telepractice and, and this being the, the 101 course, I understand that sounds really overwhelming, but just know if you need help with those kids, there's help. There's help out there. There's people who are very experienced and very, very qualified to work with those candidates and don't be afraid to ask for help because we know that that takes a little bit more um, expertise to work with those children. Yes. Um, how do we track progress? Uh, it's the same. It's the same as you would for face to face. You collect your data, you report this data in your documentation log, however um, you do that in your county, and then you use that data to determine their progress, their mastery or their regression. So there's really no difference. How do we collect data? We also collect data in the same way. I'm sorry, I just have to pause for a minute and, and thank Rhea for that lovely illustration. <laughs> Come on, Goonies people. <laughs> um, collect data based on the evaluation criteria of your selected goal. Use that data for your daily documentation and try to choose a collection method that doesn't require you to look away from the screen too much. And that's challenging uh, from time to time. The ones that I love the best are, are you know, 
um, articulation apps that that take the data for us while we're working with the student on the app. Uh, you know, those are those are the ideal, but we know that not every activity is going to have that option. There are some great apps out there. Um, for those of you interested that you can put on your phone that that help you tally and take data but but whatever works for you you just try as much as you can to still be engaged you know um when you look away from the screen and have something down on the table they can't see that they can't you know it's not the same as when you're sitting at the table with them and they see you writing things or whatever you know so so just being aware of that fact that you you um it's a little easier to lose engagement um and you want to just be mindful of that all right so let's talk a little bit about using your iPad, using apps, and screen sharing. Um, so here are some examples, some screenshots. We use kind of the two main platforms we think everyone's using right now, uh, Zoom and Teams. So um, all of you, if you look down at your own Teams screen right now, you've got like a little toolbar in the center that you know shows you whether your camera's on it's where you mute yourself um, it's where you would share content if you were going to share and it's where you see your chat participants things like that um, so uh, these are these are screenshots uh, zoom has the same type of toolbar and in the center on both programs there's a share button and on zoom when you hit that share button um, it's going to give you options for what content to share. So it's going to pull uh, whatever you have up on your computer at that moment, whether it's a particular screen, you can see you can use the whiteboard. Um, and I highlighted here in Zoom, it will give you the option to um, share an iPhone or iPad via cable or an iPhone or iPad via AirPlay. Now, let me say this, I, I run a Mac computer, so all of my equipment is Mac equipment. I have a Mac laptop, I have an iPad, I have an iPhone, I'm, I'm a, a Mac user. So uh, Mac has the built-in capability to AirPlay your devices via, via Bluetooth. If you are using a Windows-based computer and you're trying to share an iPad, we're gonna talk about some apps that you can download that give you the ability to airplay. So, um, and we can get a little bit more involved into this concept of, you know, airplaying and sharing, but I just wanted to kind of give you a, an overview of this. So when you got off of this training and you wanted to kind of play around with this with your telepractice buddy, then maybe you could start testing this out. So this is the Zoom example. This is the Teams example. Um, when you hit share, um, and I'd like to thank my sister Annie um, for this. She said in this picture of myself, it looks like I'm trying to steal the computer and, and got caught. Um, so thanks, Annie, for that. So it's not, not the greatest picture of me, but you guys get the point. Um, so you can see it, it, it's giving me options to share uh, certain screens or a PowerPoint presentation or, you know, whatever it is that that's up on my computer. Um, Teams. I'm going to work with Mark Moore a little bit on um, sharing iPad content within Teams so we can get a better training on this. Um, but I included a little tutorial. This is a live video that you guys can watch later. Um, it's for sharing your screen within Teams. But the only caveat to doing this is you have to initiate joining the Teams meeting on that particular device. So like in this example, this guy is using an iPhone, so he's joining Teams via his iPhone and then sharing the content from um, his iPhone. Now, I realize this, th this conversation may sound like Chinese to some of you who have not done any telepractice right now, but come back to these couple of slides. Once you get used to using your platform, logging on, things like that, when you when you start to get a little bit more involved, come back to these couple of slides and revisit this concept if you, once you get more familiar. So if you're going to be sharing external content via Teams, and that means you are logged on to Teams for, on your laptop or desktop computer, but you want to share an app on your iPad, 
There are ways to do that in an, in an AirPlay format, meaning it's kind of a Bluetooth connection or a Bluetooth sharing to what you have. Um, and the most common app to do that is, is called Reflector. There are lots of these, um, they're called screen mirroring apps. There are lots of screen mirroring apps out there. Um, this one has a security to, security component to it, which is why I chose to share this one, but you can just Google search screen mirroring apps and you'll find all kinds of them. Um, this one also has some other versions of it um, that you can use like with smart boards and things like that as well. But this is an app that allows you to share content from a device that's not currently running Teams. So I use the example of it is your computer that's running Teams, but you want to share the app that's on your iPad, on your desk, sitting next to you. So you could run that app. And then when you hit that share button in the center, it's going to give you that option to, to mirror uh, the app on Teams. Again, if this sounds like Chinese to you, get used to your platform, get used to what you're running, come back to these slides, come back to these concepts later. Um, and I put a little link in there for the reflector, um, for the app info. They have a website and you can go and, and learn about um, their app if, if you, you, know, you wanted to use something like this. Um, but keep in mind this, this app and most all screen mirroring apps, they are not Microsoft content apps. So if you are using Teams, this is a, um, like a third party app that you would be using for that kind of thing. So um, again, we'll get, more, we'll get more guidance on that. And we'll talk a lot more about sharing content, interactive content and things like that when we start doing the telepracticing. For telepractice 101, this is the overview. Okay. Um, I want to talk just a little bit. We're going to kind of glaze, you know, glaze over these uh, a little bit. Some of you may have seen some of these before, but I wanted to get you a little kind of getting started kit on activities. So um, in materials, so you had some places to go in the event that, you know, you're going to be checking out the telepractice uh, support teams content. There's also some things in these next couple slides that I'm going to let Sally go over um, real quick, uh, just to kind of get you started. Obviously you can come back to these, look for these particular apps, websites and things like that at your leisure. But something to consider about materials. Doing digital therapy doesn't mean you have to use all digital content. So as we mentioned before, you can use some of your favorite materials, activities, resources in a telepractice format. You just modify them slightly to be um, used in, in a virtual methodology. So you can use digital content, you can use worksheets, you can use things that you got from Teachers Pay Teachers, you can use Word documents, um, you can use you know, things you create, um, whatever you want to use in terms of digital content, you can use that via a screen sharing app or, or your screen sharing capability. You can use paper content. If you have a bunch of worksheets in your speech room and you want to use them to project them via a document camera or something like that, you can absolutely do that. Or you can take those paper worksheets and you can scan them in, save them as a file, and then share them. So it is possible to use a lot of your favorite um, content from worksheets and books and workbooks and things that you have in your room uh, via your telepractice session. We've talked a little bit about using apps. You can share, you can make these interactive and using some platforms or some options there. Um, just doing a face-to-face -face demo. So um, most all of your platforms have some various screen positions. So you can use like a speaker view or a gallery view, or you can change the view um, within your uh, platform. So let's say that you're demonstrating a sound and you want that student to mirror your action. We would change our screen to gallery view, which puts us and the student side by side. We can see both of us at the same time and we can ask that student to mirror what we're doing. We can get real close to the screen. We can ask them to get real close to the screen so we can see where their placements are and things like that. Um, so that's just a, uh, we're working together on a face-to-face -face demo. Or you can do live demonstrations. So um, Annie, the OT uh, that is uh, going to talk to you and she'll be the one doing telepracticing sessions for the OTs and PTs. Um, this spring, you know, she has the office right 
beside me in in our office, our home office here. And she does all kinds of stuff over in her office. She's over there saying, let's do the hokey pokey. Let's do, you know, this or that. Let's do this little exercise sequence. Um, and she's having the the student follow her in, in doing uh, whatever she's asking them to do in a motor format or something like that, because she may be looking for the ability to cross midline or the ability to use both hands independently or, um, you know, she's doing things that are very motor oriented uh, when she's not doing maybe seated fine motor activities that she wants the student to do with them. So um, that's just a, hey, let's do this together, just like we were in a room together. Um, let's just do it over the screen together. So they're playing music, they're dancing, they're doing, you know, whatever they, they want to do. Um, that'll be very pertinent for you PTs too, who are asking kids to do uh, very motor oriented activities. So there are lots and lots of options for general categories of materials. It doesn't have to be a perfect scenario where you have a custom made green screen or virtual background and a puppet show and all this stuff. You may want to do that um, and that's great, but it doesn't have to be that intense. So keep in mind, sometimes simple is best. Okay, Sally, I'm going to let you kind of go through uh, some of these basic activities and then we'll show um, the sample session. Sounds great. All right, so um, of course, Rhea and I are both speech pathologists, so um, you know a lot of our favorites uh, pertain to those of you who are SLPs. But um, never fear, there will be some information for uh, the other um, practitioners in the in the meeting. Um, but this is one of our favorites. Speech Tutor does a wonderful job of uh, displaying articulators to the student and um, at least when we use zoom we're able to use a highlight pen to kind of highlight areas of the mouth um, and uh, it's just a really great app to kind of get those sounds um, in, to get instruction done on those sounds and um, the kids seem to to really like it uh, there it, it actually has several different parts the pro um, you pay for and the word superhero but the the just speech tutor general um, is free. Um, articulation activities um, that you can find uh, worksheets for pretty much every sound is on heatherspeechtherapy.com. Uh, we really like her pictures. They're colorful. They're fun. The kids usually know what they are, <laughs> um, you know, so so these are some really good ones. And we do things like, you know, we share the screen and then the child gets to stamp, you know, use the annotate option um, to stamp a heart or a star uh, five times. And that also lets us know that, you know, they're aware of how many times they're saying it. And, um, you know, we can tell them, oh, no, I don't think that was a star. I think you get an X for that one. Let's try it again, you know, and things like that. They seem to enjoy that a lot. So so pretty much any websites that you have access to um, and Teachers Pay Teachers as well that have just these really nice, colorful um, pictures are, are what we tend to go for. You can do black and white and, and just, you know, pen and ink drawings, uh, but, but the colors seem to, to pop a lot better for them. Um, our Tix Picks is probably one of my favorite apps. I just really like how it's got the smiley face and the frowny face, and you can see how we've numbered the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Cards, I guess you would call them. Um, we've numbered each one, and so the child just has to say turn over number three and number eight, or or whatever they want to do um, there. Uh, and so that works really well. And um, I, I get this game requested a lot, so the kiddos really like it. And even up into some of my early middle school age kids have said, "Yeah, I'd like to play the matching game." So you can make them more complicated. This one only has 12 choices, but you can actually have more. I think there's one more that does maybe 16. Um, so yeah, that one's a fun one uh, for interacting in teletherapy. Pre-K, gosh, there's a bunch. Um, my play home, Toka Boca, those are a lot of fun. Nighty Night, My Scene, Peekaboo Barn, 
Lego Duplo World. There's one with a train that I have a lot of kiddos, boys and girls, really love. Um, and I'll have them uh, just just get language out of them by having them tell me what to do um, on the app. Um, you can target mean length of utterance, uh, vocabulary, answering questions, prepositions. Where do you want me to put this? Um, or where did I put this? Did I put it under the table or on top of the table? You know, um, all of those things can be really fun. Pronouns and then just reinforcement. We have one of our therapist is just wonderful with these little ones and she has a dog so she will use her dog as reinforcement sometimes she'll keep the dog out of the room until it's time and then she'll go get her and bring her and let let them say hi to the dog at the very end of the session or um, sometimes she really likes to utilize um, YouTube videos now be careful because there are commercials um on youtube and you want to make sure that you screen the video that you're going to use and then you have it queued up right to that video uh, you don't want any interruptions or anything coming in there that would be inappropriate um so you know she'll she'll just if the child really likes um SpongeBob. She'll have a video queued up of SpongeBob doing something silly or a little 30 second scene um, and they'll do that every so many questions or every so many um, you know uh, tasks. So that's a really a really uh, fun way for kids to get to see what they like and it helps you learn about them too and, and kind of learn what um, what motivates them. And there uh, is the YouTube uh, just we we've used it for lots of varieties of activities like requesting and then again uh, core vocabulary um, answering questions. Some websites we listed teachers pay teachers boom cards. Many of you may be familiar with boom learning. They have just wonderful interactive activities uploaded. It's similar to teachers pay teachers in that different people have boom card accounts um, that they will share um, or charge you for. <laughs> but um, but you can get like a written Rhea, you might have to chime in here, but I believe you know you can get your own boom card account and and there's different levels of um, how many boom card sets you can make. Uh, so you know if you want to look into that, we've given you a website there. Um, link to to click on um, articulation again we like that Arctic picks and articulation station uh, several of our therapists like Arctic hunt um, what's the pick Arctic I'm gonna just say I actually the kids really love that one it's not my favorite because I think some of the uh, some of the pictures are strange and the answers are strange on it but um, <laughs> uh, the kiddos always ask for it so I keep it just just for some variety uh, language apps there's quite a bit and then just word lists uh we've we've done word lists with kids before where they're just kind of going down through and putting a check mark or a or a star by it uh keep them engaged you know use use different ways to keep them engaged we also have the whiteboard option and that is an option within teams too or you can let them color let them draw if they're able to have um, remote access to it apps games and again we we've said this several times you can use a pet or or i've done things like um and when i'm decorated my house for christmas or halloween or something um i've had like a a fun little decoration that i show them they they get a kick out of that or one of my son's toys um you know um yeah uh we'll, we'll let you just kind of go over that um on your own but just just some some guidelines that you already know uh, that you utilize in therapy, but just um, finding ways to do it in teletherapy. And there are two little infographics on the telepractice uh, team support site uh, that are kind of like our top, fa our top five or six um, free apps and then our top five or six paid apps. So you can look for that too. We did that a while back and, and posted those in the team site. So if you're looking for free things or paid things, um, you can find uh, maybe something to get started with. Okay, so let's, let's look at, um, this is a sample therapy session that we recorded uh, in the spring. Um, this is actually my daughter that um, Sally is working with. 
Uh, we have some more um, therapy sessions and sample videos that we're going to be showing you when we start the telepracticing series. But um, we haven't seen a whole lot of students this summer and, and really had the opportunity to record any, um, you know, really great videos. So we'll, get, we'll be getting back to that um, pretty soon. So we can watch um, a little bit of the sample therapy session just to kind of show you the flow of kind of how things get started and how they go and uh, give you an opportunity to kind of see things in action. Just a second. All right, we're recording. Hi, Eileen, how are you today? I'm good. Good. We are going to do a fun activity to work on your S sound. So let me get it pulled up on the screen so you can see it. And I'm going to share my iPad with you today because I have a fun game on here that I thought we could do to work on your S. Well, I have a fire pad. You do? That's what my little boy has, too. It's pink, though. So. His is green. What do you like to do on that? Um, I like to play games. Okay. I don't like cool games. I, can, I do um, the paint. Painting nails. Oh, fun. That and sounds fun. What else? In a Barbie game. A Barbie game. Do you have Barbies at home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to love to play with I actually Barbie. have two Barbie games. Nice. All right, so today, since you like games, that's going to be really fun for you because we are going to do a matching game. Okay? So let me go down here and find my S. And let's start with S at the beginning of the word. What sound is that that S makes? Oh, and that's perfect, Eileen. Good job. So we're going to start right here. Now I have to put numbers on here so that you can tell me which one to turn over, okay? So let's see here. One, two, three, four. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's twelve cards, and we're going to try to find a match. I'm going to let you go first and tell me which two cards you want me to turn over. Uh, three and four. Three and four. All right, here we go. So we've got sun and sofa. So I want you to say sun for me five times. You ready? Sun. 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 That was good. You did it at a good, good pace because you looked at my fingers when they went up. Okay, so that was good and nice. Um, not too slow, not too fast. That was really good. And remember, we're keeping our tongue behind our teeth. I always call this the white gate, and we don't want to let the snake, which is our tongue, come out through the white gate, right? So we keep it like that. All right, and what about this? I call this a couch, but they're calling it a sofa. Which do you call it? A couch. A couch, yeah, you call it what I call it. But we're going to call it a sofa today so we can work on our S. Ready? Five times when my finger goes up. Ready? Sofa. 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 So far, so far. Good job. All right, so now it's my turn. Hmm. I see one that you might have already seen, and I didn't get a match, so it's your turn. What number do you want to turn over now? Um, number three. Good memory. And where's the other one? Number 10. Good job, Eileen. All right, we're going to do sun five more times. You ready? Sun. 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 Good job. You are doing great on this sound. Okay, you got a match, which means you get to go again. Two more numbers. Two and 12. 
two and twelve. Let's see. Oh, not a match, but that's all right. Let's try seal five times. Seal. 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 Nice job. And what are those down there? I call them flip flops, but they're calling them something else that starts with us. What do you think? Yeah. Can we say it five times? Sandal. 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 Good job. You're doing great. Okay. My turn. <laughs> All right, so you guys, uh, you can watch the whole session, you know, later if you want, but you guys see uh, kind of what, what goes on here. So um, you could see some of the annotate features. You could see how we use the number cards. You could see how we have the interaction. You can see how we build in the responses to collect data. Just so you know, we're used to running very quick sessions somewhere between six and 15 minutes usually is the length of our sessions. Um, and we shoot between about 100 to 125 productions in that amount of time if we're working on articulation skills. So um, this just kind of gives you a basic overview, obviously an articulation situation. Um, keep in mind that Eileen is not, she's not in speech therapy. So I just kind of dragged her in here and was like, hey, do what Sally asked you to do. Um, so you can see when we have students who are used to doing this, they're very used to this format. And you can see it only took her about two or three minutes to figure out, oh, okay, I know what I'm doing here. We're playing a game, we're doing this. Um, and our students who are used to being in speech therapy, they pop right in, they're ready to go, they're, you know, they know what's going on. So um, again, that'll be available for you, um, you know, to watch anytime you want on the, on the stream tab. Okay, Annie, do you want to talk just a little bit about some basic PT and OT materials before um, we move on? Uh, yeah, sure. So I didn't go into to great depth because you guys have already gone through the other um, telepracticing um, webinars that we did in the spring, and a lot of that information is still on there. Um, I just put like tools to grow OT, teachers pay teachers bundles. We went over that in the spring too, are great for um, worksheets, activities to do. And of course now there are just, you know, infinite resources now because we're all kind of getting used to this and we're all, you know, um, getting better and better at this. And we'll go over more resources whenever we have the um, telepracticing series again on the webinar. And also we can share those on the team site where we built that in the spring to share everything and all the information. Um, Rhea and Sally both talked about the Facebook groups, um, the blogs and everything that are out there now are, are really, really great resources. Um, a couple little things I wanted to talk about before um, we move on was, you know, we've seen a couple, I've seen a couple comments and questions. Um, you always, always, always need to check with your counties first for any sort of um, guidance, rules, um, I know someone brought up recording their sessions um, for data collection purposes, and people have commented that their county is not allowing that. Um, you know, it's a very unique situation because each county has their own policies, their own ways to do things, their own rules. So anytime you have a question like this, be sure to check with your special ed directors first just to make sure what they're doing, because we're all going to kind of be on a little bit of different wavelength with each county. Um, when they were talking about cameras and microphones and everything, um, I was going to comment that I think one thing that really helped me was switching from my stationary, you know, built in camera to this kind of more conference cam that can pan, tilt and zoom. That's helped me a lot. Um, the one I'm personally using is the, the Logitech conference cam and that comes with a little remote that I was able, you know, towards the end of the year, I kind of figured this out a little late, but I was able to kind of set up like a fine motor station, a gross motor station, um, you know, and also had activities on the, on the screen for them that I could easily transition to with that camera. So if I was working with my hands or working on a certain fine motor um, task, a handwriting task, I could, you know, um, 
move my camera or, you know, adjust it to where they were focused just on my hands and I can just you know, use my remote to like to, to go right back to my face. If I was doing gross motor activities, I could easily back up and I could zoom in and out. And I, I think that really helped kids pay attention better. And I think it kind of helped a little more with carryover and not losing them whenever I'm adjusting my computer or no, okay, now I'm going to put it on the floor so you can see what I'm doing. But I would, I would highly recommend that, especially with the uncertainty of how long we're going to be doing this or how long we're going to be doing things virtually. Um, I think the equipment is, is going to be key. And, you know, as we've all said, we're a little more knowledgeable now than we were in the spring and we have some time to kind of get things together and get the appropriate equipment or work with your special ed departments to see what kind of equipment you think you will need. Um, also, I think we're going to go over some things in the telepracticing series about the synchronous and asynchronous models. So the synchronous models of teletherapy are the one-on-one -on -one direct, um, you know, sessions where you're live. The asynchronous models, I think we may have to use, especially with, um, the the hot spots that they're going to put up around the state from my understanding um the parents or the caregivers can go to those hot spots and download um their work and then take the work home on their device so we may have to develop if we can't you know access that child at their home and the the parents or caregivers can only just drive to the hot spot download their work and go back we may have to look at more models of the you know more store and forward models of maybe videos or um, pictures or more explanatory things that we can send home with them. So we will go over all of that in telepracticing. We'll go over more resources. Um, but like I said, you guys still have access to those on the team site. So I didn't go over each of them in person. But if you have any questions at all, feel free to um, get on the teams and ask and we can start a thread. But um, that's all I've got for right now, Rhea. Okay. We have a couple questions. Uh, one regarding okay. collaboration between two professionals is a good idea, but how is that build? I'm a contract PT. Um, you know, whatever I, I just use the model that we did whenever I was in um, the, the brick and mortar buildings. Like I did co-treat with, with speech therapists and PTs and we never double build for anything. We just split that time. So I'm assuming those rules still stand where you cannot yes. double bill for the same amount of time. But for instance, you know, I had a, a, a really tough group that we had in the afternoon that the speech therapist and I were both struggling with that we saw them together for an hour and we split our time into half hour, half hour um, that we build separately. I would think you would still have to do that. Am I correct, Leanne and Libby? That's correct. You cannot, you cannot um, bill two different providers during the same time frame. So you would either have to split that time or just bill one, one professional or the other. Yes. And I think that's, yeah. So that those are going to be the same rules that apply to teletherapy. Yeah. Um, let me see. What kind of camera is that? Um, okay. I have a, um, um, so now that we're getting into the questions, um, comments, let me show you, I'm going to show you exactly what this camera is and I'll put it in the chat. Um, so we'll get into the questions part at the end of the slide. Here's our contact info. And then you'll see that, um, our telepracticing series will begin on, um, August 28th and it's going to be the last Friday of every month. Um, at for speech, it'll be at 11 and for OT and PT, it'll be at one. So it's going to be a little bit more involved this time. So a little bit more in depth, um, not as much overview. So it'll be kind of like the advanced course. Um, so let me show you, um, I'm going to show you this, um, let me see here. Let me go back. I'm going to show you this camera in the box so you guys can see what the model is. And then Annie can share her. Um, she has it actually set up in her office so she can actually show you what it looks like set up. If you guys are um, considering anything like this. So this is the camera it is a um it's a logitech camera and uh it's considered it's what's called a ptz camera 
which means pan, tilt, zoom. Um, it's the Logitech for Business uh, BCC 950 conference cam. Annie, do you want to show, can you show yours set up? Well, I'm trying to figure out how I can show them the camera without using the camera. <laughs> using it right now? Hold on. Yeah, I'm using, I'm using that camera right now. So um, just to show you guys a little bit, it has this remote that I can, you know, move around. So if I'm doing something with my hands, not my coffee mug, but, um, you know, I can show them. Sorry, I didn't really have this set up for this, but. You know, I can have like a little workstation here that I use my hands or I um, have a fine motor task and I can just immediately go back up to my face, you know, and do that. Or if I have a gross motor activity I'm doing, you know, I can stand back. I can zoom in. I can zoom out without having to go over and adjust my computer or, you know, adjust everything that I think kind of loses them a little bit. Um let me see here, Rhea, if I can switch my camera over to. While she's doing that, I'll show you this. I use the example of the external mic. This is the example of the blue snowball mic. Um, it's just a little external mic on a stand. I hook it in via USB. Um, to my computer, you can move it around, you know, I can bring it closer to my face, I can put it kind of far away, depending on, you know, what you're trying to do. Um, so it's a good option, and it's very affordable. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure I know every county has different funds and things like that. Um, but I'll put that in the chat too. If you're looking for a blue snowball mic, like I said, it's about $35 and you can get it pretty much anywhere. Um, Oh, okay. So, yeah, the blue light uh, blocking glasses. Uh, so, yeah, we all have we all have these. Um, oh, wait, I'll let Annie. Annie's got her camera there now, so you can see it. Okay. So, this is what I lovingly refer to as Wally, -E. and it has this little stand that you can make your camera higher. Um, you know, because you have different vantage points. Um, you can also put this camera directly on the base and you know make it a little lower but it also functions as a speaker or a microphone um everything and you can kind of see i don't know if you guys can see this. can you see that Rhea? how it's moving around yeah okay so you guys get the picture it's just um you know a lot easier i think to kind of be more fluid in your session especially if you're doing a mix of gross motor fine motor you know, seated activities to kind of have that camera freedom where you can move around without having to go over and physically move your computer everywhere. Um, the the conference cams, I've, I've seen them for a range of prices. Typically the pan tilt zoom cameras are a little more expensive, but I've also seen cheaper versions that you can just mount on a tripod or, um, you know, put on, on your computer that you can also pan tilt zoom. So like I said, I would talk to your special ed directors about that if they're going to you know, have any special equipment for, for teletherapy. That Logitech camera that Annie and I just showed you is about, that camera specifically is about a $500 camera. So the pan tilt zoom cameras are more expensive than just an external camera. Um, but like Annie said, you can find cheaper ones, but you know, we were looking for a specific type when we were buying those. So um, that's about a, that's about a mid, mid to high range pan tilt zoom camera. So um, Lori asked about blue light blocking glasses. Um, so we all have these. Um, I'm actually not wearing mine today, but um, we all have these, all of our, our teletherapies. Um, so the brand that we use are, are called um, Blue. And um, I'll put the website there um, for you in the chat. Um, Annie has tried out like five or six different brands of these blue light blocking glasses because she's very prone to headaches, like screen headaches. And um, so she's tried a whole bunch of different kinds and these are her favorite. So um, there's lots of different blue light blocking glasses. 
Um, these specifically are probably not the great choice for fitting over prescription glasses, but um, they may have a, a style that, depending on what kind of prescription glasses you have, they may have a style that would, would fit over prescription glasses. Can I just um, say, guys, I didn't, I got mine before our staff got um, the Bluebies. And so these I bought at Zeni Optical, Z E N I, or Zeni, Z E N N I Optical. I'll put that in. Um, and I think you can get um, the kind that fit over glasses because you can actually. Um, have the blue blocker they call it um you can actually get that on your prescription glasses you can get that on um just a variety and they also carry sunglasses that go over your regular prescription glasses so i think you can pretty much pick any frame and then have the blue blocker added to it so i'm wearing contacts right now and so i'm just wearing the blue blocker but i just ordered my son a pair of prescription that have the blue blocker so that's just another option from zanny and they're pretty reasonably priced and i really like them so these if you um, you know don't need something prescription and you know you're just looking for something basic, these are about uh, ten or twelve bucks, so they're not uh, very expensive at all. Um, and these surprisingly are actually somebody from West Virginia who designed these. <laughs> Funny enough, nice support um, local. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions, comments? Um, okay, are there copyright issues with using print materials in teletherapy? This uh, <laughs> traditionally, yes. Um, this has also been an area that's been a bit more relaxed. Um, if you're using materials for your own personal use, like let's say you're using your like Jumbo Weber book um, and you just want to use a document camera to display the G worksheet, for your students, um, there's not going to be an issue with that. You're not copying it. You're not printing it. You're not reproducing it. You're not, you know, doing anything like that. Um, but, you know, posting uh, entire books or, you know, things like that for all the world to use. Yeah, there'd be some copyright issues around that. Um, I did uh, copy and um, use some some of those worksheets early on in some of the county team site and I was doing that temporarily while you know things were kind of relaxed to be able to get some resources in people's hands quickly um, but yeah ideally if you're using them just for your own you know teletherapy rule you know for your own teletherapy sessions and you're using them in that way you know you scan one worksheet you know you you uh, project it using you know share or whatever that's going to be fine Um, I, I, I just want to know that I've looked online and there are a lot of cheaper options for pan tilt zoom conference cams. Okay. So there, there's a wide, if you just go in, but, and type in, you know, pan tilt zoom conference cam that there's, I, the cheapest one I can find is probably about like 250 to 300. You know, they are, they are a more expensive camera, just FYI. Okay, so another question from Sarah. We're advised not to do group therapy in homes, but special education teachers were holding group. Is that a county level decision? Is Department of Ed giving advice on that? Okay, that's going to be a county level decision, but I'll give you kind of the, the do's and don'ts of that or things you need to consider. So you need to consider uh, your level of exposure when doing group therapy. So you know, you're sitting in your school building or, you know, you're sitting in your um, telepractice location. And let's say you have two different students that are going to be participating in teletherapy in their homes. You need to think about the ability for those two students to view the other one's home environment. Are there any um, permission issues there are, you know, there's lots of things that uh, could go wrong when you have two students both at home. Um, 
you know, you've got one student who can now view the other student's home. What if something goes on in that student's home that would be inappropriate? Now this student and caregiver has seen it. Uh, you just want to be kind of careful with that. Um, that's a that's a discussion you really need to have with your county because I imagine whatever those special ed teachers are doing and whatever the guidance is going to be from from that angle is going to be what everyone's expected to do. Oh, and great. Leanne said Department of Ed's going to be providing guidance on group therapy soon. I'm off the hook. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions? Oh, wait, Karen's got a question about Weavis. Okay, so it looks like that might be answered. Uh, Kayla, when supervising an SLPA, I know we observed their first teletherapy session. Is that first session for every child they see? Yes, you uh, you have to have 100% supervision for the first entire session that is provided to that student. After that time, um, you know, if you've already observed 100% of their first session, then it's 25% direct supervision moving forward. Uh, are there any restrictions when graduate with graduate externs providing teletherapy? Um, at this moment, there, there are not any restrictions. We actually have graduate students who provide uh, teletherapy regularly. Um, for those of you who don't know, we actually have a co-hire with WVU um, who actually provides therapy out of uh, Allen Hall at, at WVU and she is, um, she has graduate students that rotate in and out. Uh, with her and they've been doing that for several years now to provide graduate students with exposure to teletherapy. Um, so no, there are not any uh, any restrictions with that. You just have to maintain the appropriate level of supervision and um, and guidance and uh, you need to be available should anything you know arise as an issue. So you know in our circumstance with WVU, Tracy, our SLP, is sitting there in the same room as our graduate students. So she's always there. She's always present. If there's something that goes on, she's right there to react. Um, something that you would have to consider is, are, the, are you and the graduate students sitting at different locations? You know, are you logged on um, at the same time they are all the time? It's just a little bit more of a delicate situation there that you, you need to make sure you're available in the event that something goes wrong. Um, okay, Jeanette. Hi, Jeanette. Um, is the Microsoft Teams platform supposed to be used instead of the Schoology platform for school-based therapy? Um, that's going to be a county decision. My, my uh, exposure to Schoology is that it does not have a um, teletherapy or a uh, teleconferencing ability. Uh, my exposure to Schoology is that um, it's a place where, you know, they can access resources and assignments and folders, but there's no live interactive component with Schoology. My apologies if I'm incorrect on that, but um, I just haven't seen it if, if it exists. Okay, Leanne has some additional guidance about, um, you know, some, some of the questions. Um, okay, she's answered. Okay, so Stephanie um, said Schoology does have a conference setting. I haven't tried it yet. Okay, so yeah, I haven't seen it either. Um, so if it does and your county decides to use that, um, I have no idea, Jeanette, what the level of interactiveness or sharing capability or anything is with that. Um, I would recommend, I think you're in Kanawha County, Jeanette. So. Um, I would recommend that, you know, you guys kind of get together and figure out if that's going to work for you guys in, in what, you know, you want to be able to use with the students. Because sometimes, you know, it, it might be nice to kind of streamline all that, but it really doesn't get you want, what you want to achieve with the students in terms of capability. So you guys, um, you know, have to kind of talk about that. Any other questions? Uh, Sarah, see. I can't answer your question about why you're not seeing Leanne's uh, comments, except she might not be part of the actual meeting. She's just typing in the chat. 
Um, and so these chats will be part of the, the team and the recording. Um, hey, Annie, there's a question. Um, do OTs have to observe a CODA for their first session for every student as well? No, I have not read that. Um, or whenever I talk to the licensure board, they say they said that all um, supervision requirements are the same. I think it would just be up to you and your CODA what they're proficient on, just like anything else. If you feel like they're proficient at telepractice, um, you know, I don't think they need as much supervision. But no, you, you do not legally have to supervise them for their first session. I, um, me supervising CODAs, I, I will probably supervise them for their sessions, especially since um, they didn't really do them in the spring. But that's up to you and your discretion. Um, the only real difference is that they are counting the, if you are physically on the session, or I shouldn't say physically, if you are on the session for teletherapy, that is counted as direct supervision. So you can count that as a direct supervision session. And the same goes for PT. I know PT has, um, a little more stricter requirements than OT does, where they need to see a child at least every 30 count every 30 days, um, and you can use that um, hopping onto a session as that supervision requirement. But I do not know of, and I can recontact the PT and OT boards. But as of now, um, I've not seen any guidance that you have to supervise a certain amount of time because it's teletherapy versus um, in-person therapy. All right, any other questions? The PowerPoint will be available to print if needed. It'll be in the Teams file. And I think uh, Libby sent instructions on how to join the telepractice resource team uh, earlier in the chat. I, I think Leanne posted it, yes, it's in there. And then also uh, just a little reminder, if you want a certificate, just email me um, at e e e Simmons at k12.wv.us and we will work on getting you certificates. Are there any other questions? Thank you guys. Thank you, Rhea and Sally and Annie. You guys always do a wonderful job and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And we'll see you on August 28th, right? Woohoo! Telepractice 102. There we go. And if you want the 101, it's on your team site. She cannot find the post on joining the teams. I will post that in just a minute. If you just kind of keep watching the chat, we'll get that on there for you. Bye, and we're going to stop this recording. So thank you very much. Just hang on guys and we'll get the, um, the link for you.